Hello and welcome back to another video on this channel. Recently I've been studying equivariant neural networks and find them to be a very interesting class of models. They integrate specific assumptions about the data and can lead to a better generalizability and are usually more data efficient. The theory can get quite mathematical, but in this video I will try to keep it on a high level as this is intended as an introduction to the topic. If you have questions or want me to go deeper into specific things, please let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoy the following, let's get started. And before I forget, I'm not an expert in this field, I just read a lot about it in the last weeks and this video is basically the summary of it. I want to start with some intuition about equivariance in case you have never come across this term. A desirable property for a neural network is that no matter where some pattern of interest occurs in our data, the model is able to detect it. For example, we pass this dog image through the model and get high activations for the area where the dog is. Now, the model should also respond similarly if the dog occurs somewhere else in the image. In other words, the model should be insensitive to certain transformations of the objects. Equivariance simply means that when the pattern in the input changes, the output changes in an equivalent proportion. For example, the feature activation maps in a CNN would be translated in a similar fashion like this. Okay, so that is equivariance, but you might have also heard of invariance. I also want to get this out of the way early. In the case of invariance, the output does not change at all. So it has no variance to transformations of the input. The system basically produces the exactly same response regardless of how the input is transformed. In this example, the fact that there is a dog does not depend on where it is located. So the model prediction stays the same. In many neural networks, invariance comes from pooling layers that aggregate some activations at the end of the network. For example, when you apply max pooling, it doesn't matter which neuron spits out the max value, but just that it exists. These so-called set functions like max, mean, sum and so on are a simple way to achieve invariance. One important point is that equivariances and invariances are always defined with respect to some transformation class. In this case, it is translation onto the images, because we have been moving the dog in the two-dimensional pixel space. That means no matter how we translate the object of interest, the model output should either change equally for equivariance or stay constant for invariance. Regular fully connected neural networks don't have this property as they are sensitive to the order of the inputs. It turns out, however, that there is already a model architecture that is translation equivariant, which are convolutional neural networks. In fact, one of the key motivations of CNNs besides efficiency was equivariance with respect to translations, which is achieved by convolutions. Effectively, convolutions are nothing else but translations of filters applied on the image, or in other words, the value of the feature map is computed as inner product between the input and the filter shifted by some value. Sometimes equivariance and invariance are used exchangeably, especially in the context of confnets. But by now you should know that equivariance is related to the changes in the outputs of the neurons and invariance comes from pooling operations at the end of the network. It is also possible to define this more formally with very simple expressions. A function, in our case the model, is said to be equivariant when applying some transformation t, for example translations on an image, on input x, which is the image, if the output of our model changes equivalently through some other transformation t prime. For invariance, on the other hand, the output stays unaffected. A common way to visualize this graphically is with this diagram. This is the case for equivariance. Applying some transformation and then passing through the neural network should lead to the same result as first going through the model and then applying the transformation. Or if you like to think of spaces, I also find this chart nice. Invariance maps to the same point in the target space, independent of the transformed starting point, and equivariance transforms in a predictable way in the target space 
after transformations in the origin space. Sometimes invariance is also referred to as dropping spatial information, which can be seen nicely here. To wrap this up, we can design special architectures like CNNs that allow us to process input data more efficiently by exploiting symmetries in the data. Symmetries here means that some properties of interest in our data, which were transformed somehow, stay unchanged after the transformation. These invariant models take advantage of the fact that the properties in the data are invariant to the symmetry transformations, but the data itself is not. Most people think of symmetry as simply mirroring along an axis. That's the most common type of symmetry, so-called reflection symmetry. But this mathematical concept can also be defined beyond simple reflections. In fact, there exist many other symmetries, such as translational symmetry, rotational symmetry or permutation symmetry. Generally, a symmetry transformation is a transformation that leaves the properties of an object unchanged. In our previous example, for instance, the fact that there was a dog in the image. So we want the invariant model to ignore the changes through the transformation and just focus on the properties of the object of interest. Going back to our initial example, CNNs are known to be equivariant with respect to translation, but not to rotation. So why is this? The learned filters do not respond to rotated versions of objects as long as they weren't part of the training data. That's because the convolutional filters are translated in the pixel space, but always kept at the same rotation degree. Throughout this video series, we will get familiar with ways to achieve equivariance with respect to also other symmetry groups. Incorporating knowledge about underlying symmetries in neural networks is a so-called inductive bias. That means we expect the data to follow the assumptions that the model was designed for. This makes the model more efficient and usually allows better performance and reduces the amount of data that is needed. We need to be careful, however, as we must be sure that the data follows our rules. By introducing assumptions about symmetries, the flexibility of our network decreases as we can only operate on data that aligns with our assumptions. There's a pretty good example for this in stereochemistry called chirality. The properties of molecules are usually invariant to rotation and translation. That means no matter how we arrange them in the space, the properties stay unchanged. There are, however, so-called chiral molecules, which can change their properties on reflection. If we now use reflection symmetry as an inductive bias, we need to be aware that we will not be able to separate these molecules. So it's always important to make sure that the symmetry assumptions of the model align with what we find in the data. Talking about data, what's wrong with data augmentations? Data augmentation is the most common way to make the model insensitive to different transformations and therefore most of you have probably already had a touch point with equivariance. By augmenting the data, we can make the models learn to be equivariant with respect to some symmetry class. For example, in this case, we can simply train the model not only on the dog image, but also on many rotated versions of it. This way, the model most likely produces very similar outputs for different rotations of the same image. But there are also downsides of data augmentation. On the one hand, the performance of truly equivariant models is usually better as shown in different studies. For example, quoting this paper, our model results indicate that equivariant models possess an inherent advantage over non-equivariant ones which cannot be overcome by data augmentation. Secondly, data augmentation is not as efficient as equivariant models and also doesn't work properly for all symmetry groups. Another common argument is that data augmentation can only be applied on the input layer, whereas with these models we can introduce equivariance in every layer. Let's wrap up some of the motivations for designing equivariant neural networks. First of all, we need much less data and can get rid of data augmentations. Then we are also able to introduce equivariance in all layers, not just the input layer. 
Finally, it leads to better generalizability and less complex models due to weight sharing. Just a quick check, at this point of the video you should be familiar with what equivariance and invariance are, what symmetry transformations do on a high level, and finally what the motivation of equivariant neural networks is. Let's move on with the final part of this video. First, there is a quite interesting article on naturally occurring equivariance in neural networks that I can highly recommend. It talks about the symmetries in the weights of the networks. Basically, there can be different variants of a neuron that respond to transformed versions of an input. But for more details, please have a look at the linked website in the video description. One of the conclusions of this article, however, is that natural equivariance has its limits and it can be pretty useful to develop equivariant architectures, just like it was done with CNNs. And this brings us to our first paper in this video. Essentially, the idea of this paper is to extend the notion of equivariance in CNNs to other symmetry classes beyond translation. The researchers that addressed this were Taco Cohen and Max Welling in a paper from 2016 called Group Equivariant Convolutional Neural Networks. You can say that this is the foundation of a lot of follow-up research. They present a general mathematical framework based on group theory on how to extend classical convolutions to different symmetry groups. These more general convolutions are then called group convolutions. In order to understand what's going on, we need to talk a bit about group theory and then in the next video we will investigate group convolutions in more depth. A group is mathematically defined as a set that is equipped with a binary operator, denoted with a point here. The set is just a collection of functions, for example different translations or rotations, and the group operation operates on elements of this set, such as adding them or multiplying them. So the group operator tells us how to compose elements of the set, and the output of this operation must be another member of the group. We are in particular interested in symmetry groups, therefore each of the elements in this set is a symmetry transformation. Finally, it's called a group action if the group acts on some space, for example the space of pixels. So we rotate or transform pixels with the elements in the group. You might wonder why we talk about these abstract mathematical concepts here, that's because equivariances are typically defined with respect to one of these groups. Let's have a look at an example and things will get much more clear. Let's say our set of transformations consists of different rotations. That means each element in our set is one possible rotation, such as 45 degrees, 180 degrees, 300 degrees, and also no rotation, meaning zero degrees. With the group operator, we can combine these transformations, such as first rotating by 45 degrees and then by 180 degrees. Now typically when operating on spaces, such as the 2D pixel space, we can also use a different, more mathematical notation for the transformation, instead of just saying rotation by x degrees. In the case of rotation, we can for example utilize rotation matrices. 45 degrees then corresponds to multiplying some image with this matrix and 180 degrees corresponds to this matrix. This notation is more precise and tells us what actually happens under the hood. It also allows us to parameterize different sets of rotations with just one matrix. We will come back to this in the second video. A proper group of transformations needs to fulfill four properties, which I've added here in very simple language. Closure means that the result of some transformations never leaves the group, so it's another group member. For example, if you rotate by some degree, you will still arrive at some rotation that is also part of the group. Associativity means that the composition of elements can be grouped. Furthermore, an identity element needs to exist and there needs to be an inverse element that brings you back to the identity. I won't go further into detail regarding these definitions, but we'll quickly talk about a visual way how to check if some group is valid. Let's say we have these four possible rotation degrees and the matrix multiplication operation which is performed on the matrices we've just seen. Do these elements form a valid group? 
One way to check this is to build a Kaylee table, which works by arranging all possible products of the group's elements in a squared matrix. We can for example easily identify the identity element which is rotation by zero degrees, as it will always keep the elements unaffected, as you can see in the first row and column. When continuing, we can see that the attribute closure is not fulfilled for this set of elements. Because if we apply 45 degrees rotation twice, we end up with 90 degrees, which is not part of our group. Therefore, it's not a valid group definition. This was just a very high level overview. In case you want to dig deeper into this topic, I can highly recommend the three blue one brown video on group theory. In the world of group theory, popular groups have special names. Let's have a look at a few examples. Translation in 2D is typically denoted with T. This group is defined over all possible translations in R squared. For example, we shift some object to a different position on an image. We can add 90 degree rotations to this group and we'll end up in P4. So it's a combination of 90 degree rotations and some translation like shown in this example. When operating in three dimensions, the group of rotations is called SO3, which stands for Special Orthogonal Group. Rotations in 3D can be represented using 3x3 matrices. We can also add translation here and end up in SE3, the Special Euclidean Group. In most of these symmetry groups, in 2D or 3D, the binary operator is matrix multiplication. There are many, many other groups which are systematically categorized mainly by how you can represent them mathematically. Building architectures that consider these different symmetry groups have shown promising results and here I wanted to summarize some of the most impressive applications. Group convolutions have shown to produce better results on many medical imaging datasets because they, for example, incorporate rotational and translational equivariants. There's a paper about GCNNs applied on lung CT scans for detecting cancer and the authors show that GCNNs not only perform better but are also much more data efficient. One key contribution of the improvement of AlphaFold2 over AlphaFold is a SE3 equivariant transformer that became part of the architecture. Equivariance also plays an important role in a lot of the protein ligand binding models that were recently published. Basically, this topic is about if some drug medicine fits into so-called pockets of a protein. And apparently, novel methods seem to do quite well. Generally, many molecular applications seem to benefit from equivariant priors. Another interesting application of incorporating symmetries can be found for DNA data. These double helix sequences have a special inherent symmetry called reverse complement that can be taken into account in the model architecture. Finally, variants of graph neural networks also incorporate interesting equivariances. Naturally, all GNNs are a permutation equivariant, but it's also possible to extend them in a 3D setting to be, for example, rotation equivariant as well. So as you can see, there are plenty of interesting architectures or layers for different symmetry groups, and the goal of the next video is to get a deeper understanding of some of the most popular models out there. That's it for this introduction part. At this point, you should be familiar with what groups are, what Kaylee tables can be used for, plus some of the group names, and finally applications of equivariant neural networks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again in the next part.